Good afternoon, everybody. Here with Josh and Paul and David Lehman, Economic and Community Development, and two special friends I can introduce in just a minute. Uh, very quickly, the daily summary, the numbers continue to trend in the right direction, uh, positivity rate under 2%, seven-day average a little over 2%, uh, hospitalizations low, fatalities seven. Um, it's worth remembering that uh, in all of these fatalities, 99 plus percent are folks who have not been vaccinated, 99 plus. And it's also worth noting that this was the first week in well over, in over a year where there is not one fatality in any of our nursing homes. And for that, we're really thankful. Another example, vaccines work. Um, as an example of vaccines working, this um, picture of Connecticut is sort of the exact opposite of what we showed you a couple of days ago. A couple of days ago, it was um, uh, those towns that we celebrated for being the most likely to, uh, to be vaccinated and those that had over 70, 75, 80 percent of their people vaccinated. Uh, today, you can see the mirror image of that. These are the towns of Connecticut. Um, if they're there in gray, the lighter colors, those are the ones that are the least likely to have infections. In gray is less than five cases per 100,000. Extraordinary. So that's uh, Salisbury, Canaan. Um, a lot of those towns up in the upper northwest, they had the highest vaccination rates. They have the uh, lowest infection rates. Um, a lot less red. Half as many red towns today as we had just um, a week ago, I think. So you can see enormous progress there. Um, the red, those are the areas that still have 15 cases per 100,000 or three times more than uh, some of their peers. A lot of that is uh, in and around the Naugatuck Valley, and uh, those are places that folks are um, least likely to get vaccinated. A special shout out to Danbury. Danbury has been red hot in terms of COVID infections now for um, some months, and uh, they've just moved to the orange, and that's an example of uh, progress and showing that the vaccinations work. Speaking of vaccinations, um, the president said the other day he has a goal of July 4th for 70% of all adults to at least have their first dose. I wish I could tell you that uh, we're at 70% today in Connecticut of adults with their first dose, but I think tomorrow we'll get there. So we just have a few hundred more of you to go, so we'll be able to say, um, Mr. President, appreciate your July 4th goal. We're already there, and we're going to keep going. Uh, one way we're going to keep going is they continue to expand the FDA approval for younger people to um, safely get vaccinated. I think it's uh, next Wednesday that the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is going to have their vote on whether 12 to 15-year-olds are now eligible. They just opened up Pfizer to 16 to 18-year-olds a couple of weeks ago, you probably remember. 12 to 15, we're going to get, keep our max vaccination centers going, especially on weekends because uh, that's easiest for um, you know, mom or dad to get you there, help people get vaccinated, make a big push for 12 to 15-year-olds. We're going to order a little extra vaccine, so we got plenty. Please take advantage of it. And we keep trying to have fun and keep trying to incent people to get vaccinated. Um, a couple of fun ideas. Um, you're going to hear from Joan Hartley in a second. Well, Joan, fiesta on the Waterbury Green to help celebrate Psycho de Mayo a little bit later. There's going to be food. There's going to be drink. There's going to be music. And there's going to be free walk-up vaccinations. You can just walk up, get vaccinated. You can walk up to any CVS and get vaccinated. Walk up to any Walgreens and get vaccinated. It is getting easier. And this is a fun way to do it if you're passing by Waterbury on a Friday or Saturday. UConn, I think you probably remember that we were making a big effort to get our colleges vaccinated before everybody graduated and, and you know, dispersed to kingdom come. And working with our other governors, they're doing the same thing. Um, I think we're probably a little more aggressive than some of the others. But at UConn, they're all coming back this weekend. Um, I think our very own Miguel Cardona may be the uh, speaker. But uh, more importantly, we got the uh, vaccination right there before or after um, the graduation ceremony. Uh, no appointment needed right there at the Pratt Whitney uh, runway. 
you can get vaccinated. Any family member can get vaccinated. Any friend you bring along, maybe a little shy, get them vaccinated. We got Pfizer. We got J&J. It's a really important time for you to be able to do this. And finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the fact that we lost a lot of businesses in this last uh, year, uh, in particular in our distressed communities, in particular um, uh, women and uh, minority-owned businesses uh, were the hardest hit. Uh, David Lehman, our um, economic and community development, took a special lead in making sure we did everything we could to get the PPP loans, not just to the big businesses, but to the smaller businesses as well. The Paycheck Protection uh, Loans, they're done at this point. Um, there are SBA loans for the restaurants that are coming out at this point, and I am interested to see that um, uh, you can go to the SBA, or more importantly, you can go right to DECD. They'll be able to give you information on how to get access to those loans if you're running a restaurant. Those aren't loans. Those are grants, by the way. Um, help uh, you get along. We've got, um, and the, for the next 21 days, uh, we're going to prioritize, SBA is going to prioritize women-owned restaurants, minority-owned restaurants, veteran-owned restaurants from socially distressed places, doing everything we can to help them um, keep going uh, and uh, get back where we ought to go. And um, more importantly, here's a good opportunity to do what we can to help people start up a business. And this is a real personal for me. Um, I uh, taught a class down at Harding High School in Bridgeport on how to start your own business. And I just thought there was nothing more important for those young people than to realize um, uh, the joy it is of, uh, you know, being your own boss in life. And we got them going with internships, and, um, and, uh, and we're going to try and build on that. I, I'm just so happy we have the opportunity with the federal funding and our own efforts to uh, expand that. And we've got uh, the Connecticut Future Fund, or what I sometimes call the Connecticut Equity Fund, but we're putting in place $150 million dollars. And I hope to match that with private capital so we can get up a lot more than that, maybe $300 million. Some of that's from bonding, some of that, half of that's from um, the ARP, that's from the American Rescue Plan. But more importantly, we're really going to focus on those distressed communities. We're going to really focus on um, uh, businesses that may be started by, um, you know, black and brown, women, individuals with disabilities, veterans, doing everything we can to give them a head start, give them the capital they need, give them the opportunity to be their own boss, what that means for them and their families and their communities. And David Lehman, our great um, Commissioner of Economic Development, has been taking the lead on this and maybe can walk us through. David? Great, Governor, thanks so much. And, and Max, if you don't mind putting up that second slide. So, Governor, as you mentioned, this is a significant initiative, $150 million uh, for the Connecticut Future Fund. And there's really two main pillars of that fund. Uh, you outlined this is going to be at least 50% of the money invested over a three-year period, really focused on our hardest-hit communities. The first main pillar are going to be investment funds that really prioritize these communities. And what's going to be really important about this initiative versus previous initiatives is we really want to have flexible capital. This is not just going to be one type of loan or a one-size-fits-all product. We envision these vehicles to be able to offer equity investments in businesses, low-cost debt, grant funding, as well as monies for either proof of concept and or technical assistance in other training. DCD will run an RFP process to look for up to three managers, and these would be community development and financial institutions, or CDFIs, or other non-bank lenders that are in our communities today or want to want to have a bigger footprint in our communities to have an impact. So we'll run that process. And as Governor, you mentioned, one of the key aspects of this, in addition to the size being more significant than what the state has done in the past, we really want to engage the private sector here and are going to be asking these fund managers to do the same, uh, challenging philanthropists, uh, corporations to co-invest alongside the state money. There's been a lot of discussion around that, and we think there's a, a real opportunity to make this initiative even larger and have the state drive it, uh, but with a significant amount of co-investment capital from corporations and philanthropists. Uh, in addition, the last part of this pillar is uh, an additional partial state guarantee program as well that we plan on offering to our banks. It would be an opt-in program, but another way where the state can uh, de-risk certain uh, instruments and provide more capital to our hardest hit communities. So this will be a key initiative. Again, we, we envision this money to be spent over a three-year time period uh, in these areas. Next slide, please. 
The second pillar, and this one is sized at 25 to 50 million, uh, th this is going to be a partnership with Future Fund and Connecticut Innovations, which is a, a quasi-state entity that exists today and, and is really a, a large venture capital arm in the state. And in this, this aspect of Future Fund, they would look for high growth companies and startups in the state of Connecticut, where you have either a diverse CEO, a diverse management team, or a diverse board. And these are companies that are gonna be focused on, on technology, dis disruptive uh, aspects of of, of uh, the current business ecosystem and other new products. Again, high growth, think typical venture investing, but really focused on, on equity here and in the uh, C-suite as well as the boardroom. Uh, the, the, uh, the key difference with this pillar versus the previous one is these investments are gonna be a bit bigger, uh, a quarter million dollars to up to two and a half million dollars, and this fund will be a bit concentrated. But in aggregate, both these investments, we think will really move the needle uh, for our small businesses, really driving innovation and growth in the state of Connecticut across all of our communities. Back to you, Governor. Uh, this is um, a big step up. We have something called the Minority Business Initiative that uh, includes David Lehman. It also includes um, Senator Doug McCrory. Doug is um, a great friend. He's chairman of the <coughs> Education Committee. And the Minority Business Initiative, which has been focused along these lines, really to the heart of Doug McCrory, has been about $25 million over the last five years. We're going to step that up. This is about $150 million over the next few years. And, Doug, what does that mean to the community? What advice do you have for us? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for giving me an opportunity to be on this panel with you guys to talk about something that is very important something I've been working on personally through the NBI. Uh, what this is, is an opportunity, right? This is an opportunity to do something that we have never done, in my opinion, in my 16 years as a legislator in the state of Connecticut. This is an opportunity to invest in, com in communities, in my opinion, that have been marginalized since the 1960s. And in my opinion, um, and then you can go back and look at the research, um, the facts are we as a state have not invested in these communities and therefore since we didn't put public dollars up we didn't see a lot of private dollars invested in these communities and private dollars that have come to these communities and the public dollars pretty much went down to the business business areas of these communities right we have we have put a lot of resources in the downtown areas but not much into the communities where the people live and work this is an opportunity to change that narrative i heard the governor mention that he talked classes at, at Harding High School. That's great. Unfortunately, in many of our schools, we, they're not highly resourced. So many of our students don't get an opportunity to learn what to do. By doing this investment, this investment over three years, which the governor said, previously we only put $5 million in over a five-year period. That's what the investment has been for the state of Connecticut, sadly. And we wonder why the communities stay this is an opportunity, if done correctly, to partner with private entity to change and transform communities that will enhance opportunities, provide resources, access to capital, and allow the people in those communities to do the things they need to do, know how to do, to change. I'm excited about it. Um, I think it's, again, this is an opportunity that has, that has never lent itself to Connecticut. And quite frankly, I mentioned private and public. It has been private and public institutions that created these marginalized communities, redlined them, through banking, and through policy. And it's going to take government and private entities to change it. And it's not going to change overnight, but this is a step in the right direction. I will just say this uh, in, in, in closing, uh, and I'll answer any questions that you might have. Um, the people in these communities uh, know what it takes to change them. Unfortunately, policies have been dictated from the top down, and that's why you haven't seen much change over the last 50 years in these communities. We have opportunity to provide resources for so many young people or older people who, are who have the entrepreneurial spirit but don't have the resources. All these people in these communities are not going to go on to college as we wish they would, but they are so knowledgeable, but did not and don't have the resources or the lack of opportunities. Um, I'm excited about it again. I'm going to make sure my eyes and ears are wide open 
and stay on top of these because I don't want to have this conversation three years from now that we have not seen trans transformational changes in these communities. If we do this right, this is a step in the right direction and we can change Connecticut and make it a, liv a livable place for everyone, whether you live in an urban community or a suburban community. Opportunities must exist for all folks and this is a step in the right direction once we do it the correct way. So again, David, I want to thank you for listening to the community, listening to legislators who have cried out for a number of years about transformational work. I want to thank the governor for um, lending his voice to this, understanding that this is what is important. This is what's going to drive us. If, I can, if our cities in, in this state are not thriving, our, our state cannot thrive. So I'm again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to communicate this to you. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to let the people let you know policy makers what the people on the streets are looking Hey, well said, Senator McCrory. I really appreciate that. And let me just introduce uh, your associate in the um, state Senate, uh, Joan Hartley. Uh, Senator Hartley, um, is maybe uh, some of you know, is a chairperson of the uh, Commerce Committee. And she knows uh, full well the importance of giving everybody an opportunity to follow their dreams. Joan? Thank you, Governor. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, for this exciting announcement. Uh, my colleague, Senator McCrory, just uh, ended on the note about listening. And today's um, announcement is really about listening to um, small businesses, challenged businesses, It is not because of the people who are living in those communities uh, we should put the blame on. I think we're doing a better job now, but we're late. And we would have listened to those people who knew, who had a voice in those communities and did what was expected. It was communicated to the Department of Public Health. We wouldn't be in this condition. That's my point. Right, fair enough. Thank you, Joe. Go ahead. Senator McCray, I'd like to, to follow up on that um, because we, we see now that some of those gaps are maybe starting to close a little bit um, in the vaccination rate disparities. But can you talk about the impact that it makes that the, those disparities, those vaccination rate disparities were there to begin with, regardless of whether they close or don't close in the future, if that makes sense? I think, I think there's historic information that everyone knows why there were people who were hesitant not saying they didn't want to get it just because you're hesitant doesn't mean you did not want to receive it but we know the history and that's why it was so important to educate folks on why we should be doing that as just opposed to telling people to go do it our community knew we wanted the vaccine we wanted access to the vaccines but we wanted to make sure that people were providing that understood our history and was going to treat us the way unlike the healthcare system has treated us in the past and, 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 and currently, right? These things, these ideas that our communities have about um, vaccinations and just about healthcare are not something that they pulled out of the hat. This is historic and we knew that. The numbers are gonna get better. They are gonna get better. But again, we didn't do a good job in my opinion. I didn't, and I would challenge anyone, anyone on what I said about this. But the numbers are getting better but we still have to continue to educate. And as we move forward, and if we start to listen now, the numbers will get better. If the vaccines are available, they have to be available. And we gotta find a way to make sure when those vaccines are available in those urban communities, they are put in the arms of the people who live in those urban communities. Unfortunately, the reality is those vaccines are available in the urban communities, but the people in the urban communities are not getting them in their arms because they did not have access to vans to sign up for. Now that we're doing it, when you don't have to go to the vans, you can walk up and get these things done, you will see these numbers get better. That's because you have a, a, a lack of access to technology. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we were the lack of, there was a, there was a, a technology gap. Everyone knew that ahead of time, but we did not, we didn't plan for it. But now that it's easier, the access is, is available, then you'll see the numbers get better. 
Let's hope so. Senator. And well, Vermont, well, uh, well, Governor Long, can I just ask one quick follow-up? I'm sorry. Um, with the, the percent of the adults who are currently eligible statewide who have not yet gotten a, a first or second shot, um, do you have a sense of whether that's kind of like active opposition to getting vaccinated or is it more like ambivalence or people aren't sure that they, they want to so they haven't gone out to do it? I think it's a, probably a mix, Emily. I, I did see three or 4,000 people uh, surrounding uh, the Capitol building about a week ago. So uh, they, that was not ambivalence. I think probably for the younger population, um, it's not an ideological statement. I think it's sort of, um, I'm pretty busy. Why do I have to bother right now? And that's why- um, It's you know, time to hear- in Explaining why it's important to do it, as Doug was saying. And not just do it, but why it's important is so important, especially for those uh, demographics. Thank you. Move along next to Channel 3 Eyewitness News. It's time yes, to take Governor, all this. I apologize. I think I was on the phone when you took uh, the AP's question. I just wanted to know if there was any indication as to when the eviction moratorium would end. Uh, I've got to talk to um, Sayla and, and Paul about it, but I think we were talking about at least uh, uh, one more month after uh, the May 20th um, uh, date, which is where we are right now. Hopefully and, and we'll, have, uh, we'll have the rent relief program really cranked up at that point. Got it. And are, do you have any projections of how many evictions we could be looking at when the order drops? Paul, do you have an idea on that? No, no Governor, I don't have a, a broad understanding of how many numbers, but I'll say this is the governor felt that it was very important to make sure uh, not only uh, getting our rent relief program uh, up and going and robust, but also provide legal support for those who are potentially going through the eviction process, uh, particularly through his uh, federal recovery, uh, Connecticut recovery plan that's currently in front of the legislature at this time. Uh, I know that's received broad support from the housing advocates who have really wrote to us, including uh, uh, Representative uh, Rosa DeLauro, who also reached out to the governor in our office to say that this is an important aspect of utilization of these dollars during these tough times. So while I don't have the actual number, I will say that we are prepared uh, by making sure we provide the necessary resources and support uh, for uh, these individuals. Got it. And, and my final one is, you know, when the 12 to 15 year olds are eligible, will the mass vaccination sites be available for them or are they going to be taken down sooner rather than later? We're going to keep them up for now. Uh, as I implied before, I think weekends you're going to find a lot of young people. Parents can drive there. So we're going to uh, make sure they're available for a little bit longer. Thank you very much. News 8. Governor, earlier uh, today you announced the uh, partnership with the, uh, the nine um, historically African-American fraternities and sororities. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I'll start. Um, you know, following on what uh, Senator McCrory was saying, it's really important to have trusted advocates who are out there explaining the importance of the vaccines. So we're working with the fraternities, sororities, ministers, um, state senators, you know, folks who can talk to the community from a position of, um, you know, credibility. And uh, that's what that partnership is all about. It's part of our overall outreach we're trying to do uh, to um, get that final 35%. Also, um, regarding the... Uh the ban yesterday, uh, the, the judge who struck down the CDC's ban on evictions. What does that mean for evictions at the state level? Do you worry about legal challenges? And would you consider lifting the moratorium at this point? Uh, we sort of talked about that. Um, no, the state of Connecticut is going to um, keep going. We're going to keep the ban on evictions a little bit longer. We're getting the rent relief program really going now with uh, SALA over in the Department of Housing. But we need another uh, you know, month or two in order to be able to make sure tenants as well as landlords are uh, taken care of there. Thank you. The Connecticut Mirror. Um, Commissioner Lehman, um, Senator McCrory and Senator Hartley, thank you for listening um, to the community on this. Can you give us some details as to what that entailed? Uh, who did you reach out to and what did you learn?
Doug, you want to start? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I can't speak for David, but David and I have been working pretty well since he came on. And I, I'll be honest with you, uh, David does listen. And he didn't just listen to me, he listened to the members of the NBI board. Connecticut Public Radio comes from the Bible Projects Fund, supporting the museum. That provided him um, examples of how things Boy, be done right here in community. Connecticut. They not necessarily have to be done the tra traditional way, because we've been successful um, at this point surviving without the resources. Now imagine if we do get the resources and allow those people in those communities to operationalize them, you will see overall change. So I would give David credit for listening to ideas that came from the community who know what needs to be done, who know that it's not just getting loans out, you have to, you have to service those loans and service those small businesses who have great ideas, but didn't have access to capital. So now he's going to put capital resources in play with it, it combined with those people who have the uh, cultural competency to communicate what needs to be done for small businesses and not just small businesses, but, but for economic growth in those communities. Thank, thank you, Doug. Joan, anything you want to add? Or I'm happy to close it out after that. Yeah, well, I, I just briefly want to say our experience here in this district was that um, <laughs> you and your team, Gwen, um, and the rest of the shop were 24-7 uh, here, if it was a, a Zoom with our chambers, um, uh, our small business entities, um, you were there to work on individual cases. And I also know that you know through SBA, um, there were initiatives of going door to door to communities um, to try to get the word out and to reach the underserved um, and, and folks who quite frankly didn't even have an idea that they would be able to uh, have an opportunity for uh, any of these um, resources. So um, it's, it's been a, a, a positive experience. Um, I have to say, I think probably everybody's on you know, overdrive because it's, it's been a long um, initiative. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you both. Just quickly, so Pat, Pat, there are really three main areas that we heard from, and, and this is really over the past couple of years. Uh, you know, one, uh, DCD works with a lot of community foundations, so uh, HEDCO, uh, Women's Small Business Development Center, that there's many of them around the state that are key partners of ours to provide either loans or technical assistance, so we got a lot of feedback from them. Uh, secondly, Senator McCrory and I sit on the MBI board, and that's a role that we meet monthly. Uh, we get lots of feedback at, from at the board level, uh, board member level, as well as filtered up through the board in terms of what are the needs, what are the constraints. Uh, and the last thing I would say on that is we heard very, very clearly through those metrics and through businesses that the tools that we have were not adequate. Uh, and Senator McCrory touched on some of this, but we've had defined loan products that can be quite rigid. So this is going to be a much more flexible endeavor. It's going to be bigger in size, and we're going to make sure that we're providing that technical assistance. Because you can't just say, here, here are loans, take our loans. It, it doesn't work that way. You're not going to be effective in really penetrating these communities. So that, that, those are a lot of the areas that helped inform this uh, this policy and decision. If cannabis is- I'll just add one thing as well, um, uh, in terms of just from seeing from my angle, obviously, the, the, the appreciation that the governor I have at David is the fact that David has, he, he's not just taking meetings from an office, he is getting in his Jeep and he's traveling around the state. And he's going directly into these communities uh, where the investments need to be made. He has seen it up close. He's done this. He's done the walking tour with both of the senators that's on this call. And I, I received calls from representatives and senators and business uh, people in the business community and people within the community who've called me directly about how they've seen David out and about. I don't think David, uh, I know the two senators gave David a lot of the credit, but I know from the governor and I, we feel that David is a great representation of the type of uh, investment and the type of work that we're looking forward and looking for in our commissioners. If cannabis is legalized, is this a program that people um, are interested in uh, that, that business, can they access that? And, and also, also related, will this reflect in any way in the negotiations over the social equity portion of the cannabis bill? 
So it's a great question, Pat. If, if it is legalized, the short answer is yes. Uh, part of this is, uh, initiative will be funded through state bonding dollars, part through federal SSBCI dollars. That We haven't seen the final rules on SSBCI, but there may be some constraints with marijuana and cannabis at the federal level, but we can utilize the state dollars. So I think to the extent there are new cannabis-related businesses, that is certainly something we should consider. And I'm sorry, SSB, uh, BCI, give, give the, me that one. The state, so that's the, within ARPA, it's the State Small Business Credit Initiative. It's okay. basically a, a small business focused investment vehicle within ARPA. And that's what we're using to fund half of this initiative. All right, thank you. NBC Connecticut. Hi everyone, it's Catherine Lloyd with NBC Connecticut. Um, I have a question for the governor and then I'll, I'll send it over to Commissioner Lehman. But first governor, we're talking about these um, mass vaccination sites for the 12 to 15 year olds and, and Senator Hartley touched on this, but are parents required to be physically present? If so, do they have to show proof of guardianship? And is there any consideration of maybe doing some sort of permission slip type thing, you know, in case maybe somebody can grab a drive with a neighbor or a friend and their parent can't actually physically be present with them? You certainly need that permission. Um, do, do they have to be physically present? I think Josh, talk to the provider of the site that you're going to and they'll give you specifics about what flexibility might be available. Do you hear that? Yes. And then, um, are there, would there be an opportunity for parents to get vaccinated as well? Say they are not vaccinated, Absolutely. they take their child. If it takes a 12 year old to get dad vaccinated, thank the 12 year old. Sure, okay. And uh, Commissioner Lehman, as far as the minority business initiative goes, do you have percentages on, you know, how many businesses in our state are owned by minorities? How many are women owned, veteran owned, uh, that type of thing, are we tracking that? So we, we have some data. We don't th see that through MBI. We, we typically will utilize census data and other statewide uh, polls that are taken. I don't have that offhand, but I can give you that as a follow. up Sure. And then, oh, Governor, right. one more. Oh, go ahead, Senator. We don't have that data. I don't think we have that data. And if we do have it, it's not accurate. And it's not accurate. I know that. And also, along with what we're doing here, we also look into a disparity study, something that hasn't been done in the state of Connecticut for 30 years to find out the capacity of a minority business in, in the state of Connecticut. That's what really needs to start this. This will jumpstart what we're trying to do with these, this $150 million. Great, thank you. Um, and Governor, uh, nursing home workers, planning to go on strike on the 14th right now. Are you in talks? Is there any sort of contingency plan in case that does happen? Well, first of all, um, Paul and Melissa are in active talks with the um, uh, nursing homes um, and uh, trying to put together those frontline workers every day throughout this pandemic. We're doing everything it took to keep um, uh, the residents there at the nursing homes safe. Um, a lot of the money went to nursing homes. Not all of it went um, as much as we wanted uh, to the frontline workers. And those are the type of things we're negotiating right now. But, but if a strike does come to fruition, if those negotiations aren't done in time, will there be staff in those homes? Is that something you're working on? Yes. And do we know where those people will come from? Paul? Well, obviously, it's, uh, the Department of Public Health, uh, by law, uh, will have to uh, work with the nursing home industry to make sure that there's staffing to support the residents there. Um, obviously, this process is ongoing, but first and foremost, the governor is focused on ensuring that uh, the providers of the nursing homes and uh, the workers can get to an amicable agreement as it deals with their uh, negotiations. Obviously, the state has a small part to play in it. And that's the part that the governor is uh, referring to that myself, uh, Secretary Melissa McCall and Commissioner DJ Gifford are playing a part on behalf of the governor. Uh, we met uh, earlier today with the nursing home industry. Later, uh, earlier this week, we met with um, representatives of, uh, of those within those facilities. And we're gonna be uh, continuously working on this uh, to uh, avoid uh, what we feel um, uh, what can be if a strike does occur, uh, but by law, we, we have to prepare if it does occur. But in the meantime, we're working to ensure that the, the two parties can be able to get to an amicable agreement as part of their contracts. Thank you very much. First Connecticut Media. 
Hey, Governor, following up on uh, Senator McCrory's point about access, uh, I'm curious how much you see door-to-door -door canvassing uh, factoring in the next round of vaccinations. Um, I, I know that might be complicated with uh, if 12 to 15 year olds can get it. Um, where do you see that being employed? I, I can tell you we've done a lot of door-to-door -door canvassing. As uh, you know, the Senator said, uh, not everybody goes online and just uh, you know, signs up on vans. And it was really important. So we have the LEAP program. We're going door to door. We're telling families about um, get your kid back in school. The schools are open. They're safe. We have the summer programs uh, coming on, the summer learning programs. And if, most importantly, here's your opportunity to get vaccinated. This is when the mobile van will be there. Do you need a lift? We'll get you a lift to take you down in the mobile van. I think this is going to continue for a while. Thanks. And then looking at the data um, that that sort of hold up in vaccinations for the younger folks, um, do you think that do you have any um, indication of, of what that is? Is it hesitancy or is it, you know, younger people have been uh, exposed to the virus at a higher rate and, and maybe hesitant for that reason? Uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, 16 to 30, which is uh, uh, less likely to get vaccinated right now. You saw some, from some of our previous graphs, you know, um, you know, 50, 60, 70 year olds didn't start tailing off till they were, you know, 65 or 75 percent um, vaccinated. At the younger ages, not as much. Um, I don't know. When I was 18, I probably would have been a little casual about it. And uh, shame on me. And our job is to do everything we can to remind those young people it's about keeping them safe and their family and their friends safe. Thanks. And then uh, lastly, on a slightly different topic, um, you talked recently about uh, some of the gun violence in Hartford. Uh, do you see yourself sending state police uh, to that city again um, to support uh, the follow up to that or or is that not warranted? Well, no, as requested, and as you probably know, we've done that um, around the state um, upon request as needed. But what we're really finding is uh, we also need the social workers and we need uh, those involved in, uh, um, you know, addiction services and domestic violence. So when we get that 911 call, maybe it's a policeman who has to be there because there may be a threat of some violence, but also you may need a, a social worker there who knows how to mitigate the situation. And final question to Paul Hughes, the Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thanks. Uh, first off, uh, Senator Hartley, as uh, vice chair of the Appropriations Committee, can you tell us what is the status of the legislature's um, planning for the uh, ARPA money here? Hi, Paul. Um, so actually, last night was kind of a long night. We had a chance to kind of chat about this. Um, we are hoping to have a public hearing um, so as to get the input. You know, it's a very short turnaround. I believe the date is May 16th. Um, and so uh, once again, everything is remote. And so that is how the Appropriations Committee and the Finance Committee has worked to date. Um, we worked in subcommittee arrangements, uh, as you know, for the um, the overall budget. Uh, I am not sure organizationally if it will be uh, subcommittees as well. You, we also have our house chair, you know, who is um, having a bit of a hiatus, uh, having some uh, surgery. Uh, so there's, you know, been that kind of um, uh, a lag, but we've got that hard date um, and we are, you know, ha oh, intent to get all of the input, go through it, um, and uh, work collaboratively with the legislature and with um, the Office of the Governor and the Governor. But there's been no meetings, there's been no discussions at, at, at this point? Well, you know, the truth is we just, you know, had a very long meeting on Monday, which was all of the referrals and then, uh, you know, it, it, Chambers House was in, uh, you know, the day before and then we were just in. So we're now at this juncture where that's, that is the focus. So, um, the, no, there has not been a date certain. Uh, I expect that mm -hmm. there will be. And um, the, this uh, equity fund proposal that was just outlined here, the $150 million uh, uh, fund, um, is that something that you think the, the legislature would incorporate into its plan? Well, I, I think it's a very sound proposal. Quite frankly, Paul, it checks all the boxes and it does it in a very 
um, uh, methodical way. Uh, there may be some tweaks, additions to it, but I think the core of it is very sound um, and will resonate with uh, my colleagues on the Appropriations Committee and the General Assembly. Okay, thanks. And uh, Commissioner Lehman, uh, will there be any incentives provided to uh, private businesses and uh, uh, philanthropists to uh, invest, uh, to co-invest? I think the incentive is they're going to have a huge impact on their state. And, and there was a lot of discussion and has been a lot of discussion on making a difference and having an impact in equity. And uh, we want to make sure they know the state's making a significant investment and this is their chance to make it even bigger. So I, I think that's all the incentive they should need. Uh, and Josh, can you give us the uh, the update on uh, the uh, S the high SBI zip codes in terms of uh, vaccination goals? Yeah, in the last week uh, we were up to thirty percent uh, against the thirty percent target, so that's the highest we've been so far. Excuse me, thirty percent? You said thirty percent. Yeah. All right, uh, and uh, Governor. Um, Keeping us busy here, Paul. Yeah, well, I've, I've been waiting a little bit. Uh, obviously, you guys had some technical difficulties. Uh, I, I was just wondering, do, do you have any opinion on uh, uh, this pilot program that the Senate approved last night uh, that would, uh, I guess, uh, test out uh, signature verification for absentee ballots uh, in the 22 uh, elections? I guess five towns would be uh, selected. I don't know if you're even aware of it. I'm somewhat aware of it. Oh, look, I'm I'm happy to take a look at it. Um, my my broad feeling is we went through the election. We did it with integrity. We made it easier for people to vote. We had a high percentage of people who voted. I've heard very little complaints about any discrepancies. So let's make sure we're not coming up for, with a solution for which there's not really a problem. Okay, thank you very much. That's it for me. And that was our final question. So, Governor, off to you. I'll just say, uh, you know, Joan and Doug and, and David, for your initiative on the um, future fund, the equity fund, call it what you will. Um, we got a lot of healing to do. We're coming out of this COVID thing. Um, uh, from a health point of view, we're leading the pack as, as a state, I think, and getting more and more of our people vaccinated and getting back to a new normal. We spent a little bit of time over the last uh, few weeks talking about mental health and how that has stressed people. And uh, today is just a reminder that a lot of people lost their business. A lot of people lost their economic uh, well-being. And, um, and that was in the restaurants and the service sector. And we're doing everything we can to save the businesses that are out there and uh, giving everybody else an opportunity to start something up. And that's what this uh, program is all about. And it's really focused on those folks from the most distressed communities who never really had access to the capital uh, before. They know their communities better. They know the type of businesses that might succeed there. Here's your opportunity. Thanks, everybody.